host, Nick Jacomis, and today I'm speaking with Dr. David Anderson. David is a professor of neuroscience at Caltech, and he runs a research lab that studies the neurobiological basis of behavior and emotion in animals ranging from fruit flies to mice. His lab uses a lot of cutting-edge neurotechnologies, including things like optogenetics and chemogenetics, which we got into in our discussion, to understand exactly how specific neurons, cell types, and circuits in the brain are actually causally related to animal behavior and emotion-like states in animals. So his lab is really interested in questions around how behavior is generated by different circuits in the brain, how all of those neurons are coordinating and wired up, and how they fire to actually generate certain types of behaviors. And they're also interested in questions around emotion. What is emotion and what are emotional states in the brain? To what extent can we objectively study things like emotional states in non-human animal models using the tools of neuroscience that we discuss in this podcast and a bunch of other things that are really fascinating. David also recently authored a new popular science book called The Nature of the Beast. And we talk about a lot of the subjects he covers in that book. And that includes everything that I just mentioned, how you study something like behavior or emotion in a cause and effect fashion as a neuroscientist, how we interpret all of the results that we find in animals and try to determine whether or not they can be translated to humans, and how some of these results from his lab, from other labs, how some of these neurotechnologies might end up being used for human therapeutics and the types of inferences we can and cannot make from animal studies about what might be true for the human brain. So if you're interested in the neuroscience of behavior, how the brain actually generates it, in the neuroscience of emotion, what it is and how it might be studied, then and this episode will be really interesting for you. David is a world-renowned expert on the neuroscience of behavior and emotion. His lab is really on the cutting edge of studying these things. And so if you're interested in aggression or sex or other types of animal behavior, we get into some of that in this episode. If you're interested in things like hormones and how sex hormones regulate and change behavior across an animal's life cycle, we get into some of that stuff. And if you're interested in some of these neurotechnologies that neuroscientists actually use to study cause and effect in the brain, this is going to be a really interesting episode. This episode is supported in part by Athletic Greens. Their main product, AG1, is a comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition product containing 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food sourced ingredients with less than one gram of sugar per serving, no nasty chemicals or artificial anything. It's gluten and dairy free and compatible with paleo, vegan, vegetarian, and ketogenic diets. AG1 is a quick and convenient way to supplement your diet to help ensure your body is getting the nutrients it needs. It comes in powder form and you can mix it in water and drink it, or you can put it into a smoothie or a shake or something like that. I mix it into water and drink it with the first meal of each day, and it's super convenient. If you go to athleticgreens.com slash mindandmatter, Athletic Greens will give you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Their vitamin D product comes in tincture form, so you just take one drop each day. A large fraction of the population is actually vitamin D deficient, especially in winter months when we get less sun exposure, and vitamin D is super important for the proper function of the immune system and for a variety of other things. And there's even evidence indicating that vitamin D deficiency is correlated with more severe cases of COVID-19 in those who get infected. Every time I go into the doctor each year for a checkup, I'm always told that vitamin D deficiency is very common and I should be supplementing on a daily basis. So visit athleticgreens.com slash mindedmatter or click the link in the episode description. You'll get a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. This episode is supported in part by The Amino Company. They specialize in making science-backed amino acid products that you can mix into any drink. Their products contain a mixture of essential amino acids, the building blocks of proteins in the body, as well as other nutrients including minerals like iron and electrolytes like potassium. Your body is constantly repairing damage and your muscles and tissues need the right mix of amino acids and nutrients to do this effectively. One thing I like about AminoCo is they actually conduct clinical trials to determine what their products really do. They have a variety of formulations and engineered for different purposes, and my personal favorite is one called Heal, which has been shown to be three times more efficient at triggering muscle growth and repair than other protein sources. It helps maintain healthy inflammation levels and preserve muscle mass during periods of inactivity. I mix this product into the water bottle I bring to the gym and consume it before, during, and after my workouts, and I have felt a noticeable difference in my performance during those workouts and my recovery times from soreness and fatigue afterwards. Their products are keto-friendly, soy-free, vegetarian or vegan, gluten-free, and non-GMO, so they are compatible 
compatible with almost any diet or lifestyle. You can support the podcast and try Heal or any of their other products by using the discount code MIND when you visit aminoco.com slash mind. You will get 30% off your purchase. If you work out regularly or do intensive exercise, I recommend trying AminoCo's products. I get a lot of companies reaching out to me about advertising, and I only end up using and liking a small percentage of the products that I see. So check out aminoco.com slash mind and use the code MIND to try these products today for 30% off. And with that, here's my conversation with Professor David Anderson. maybe start by telling people who, who you are, what your lab studies, and, and what you do at a very high level. Sure. I'm David Anderson. I'm a professor at California Institute of Technology, otherwise known as Caltech in Pasadena, California. And I'm also a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator and the director of the Chen Institute for Neuroscience at Caltech. And my lab tries to study brain circuits in animals that control behaviors that are very basic survival behaviors like mating and fighting and predator defense, and which in humans are associated with emotion states to try to understand what we can learn about human emotions by studying animal brains and whether that will improve our ability to develop new treatments for mental illnesses in the long run. And we work mainly on mice and also on fruit flies to see how evolutionarily ancient the principles that we discover are. Yeah. And one of the things we'll talk about is how sort of taking that evolutionary perspective or studying animals that are in many ways simpler or seem to be very different than humans is nonetheless useful when we start thinking about things like developing new therapies for humans. And one of the things that you point out very early in your new book is you say, quote, the sad fact is that there hasn't been a fundamentally new psychiatric drug approved in the last 50 years. All of the so-called new drugs being released are just variants on the same basic theme. So to sort of set the stage for a lot of the research that you and others are doing, can you explain why that's the state of things today in psychiatry and why we've we've seen the sort of uh, stagnation in the development of new therapies? Yeah, there, there are a couple of reasons um, why that's true. And uh, the, the first reason is that most of the drugs that are used in psychiatry widely, like uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, were discovered by accident. They were not discovered through any principled process of experimentation that led to an understanding of a disease mechanism and suggested a way to treat it, um, such as we can do or as was done in the case of diabetes. Once people understood that diabetes was a disease due to insufficient insulin production by the pancreas, and they knew what insulin was, and they knew how to purify it or synthesize it. They discovered that you could make people with diabetes feel better by giving them more insulin. There's no psychiatric drug that is used today that was developed using that procedure. So that's that's problem number one. Um, problem number two is that the search for new psychiatric drugs uh, is uh, has gone on for several decades and led to a number of notable failures, such as uh, drugs that attack uh, the neuropeptide substance P for treating depression and anxiety. That was a big failed clinical trial or drugs that try to reduce stress by uh, blocking the uh, brain chemicals that cause cortisol release, uh, CRH, which is a particular neuropeptide. And many people blame those failures on the fact that the drugs were tested in rodent models and that the rodent models are not predictive of human biology. And that's why there were all these failures. And therefore, going forward, we would have to use non-human primates as the 
animal models for discovery, drug discovery, and drug testing, and that is very, very expensive. And even then, it's not clear whether the results will immediately translate into humans. Um, and so uh, that that has those failures have made a number of the pharmaceutical uh, companies and biotech companies so gun shy that they've closed down entirely their neuroscience programs and not just uh, to try to look for new psychiatric drugs, but also drugs for neurological disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Too many failures and no clear knowledge-based pathway for identifying new drugs that would be targeted to a particular psychiatric disorder. Hmm. And is it fair to say that you know th those two problems that you pointed out, what they seem to have in common to me is that both of them have to do with the fact that I think the brain is just very complicated and we know relatively little about how it works compared to other organ systems in the body. And so there's just this basic knowledge problem. That's right. <clears throat> That's exactly right. And un until we're able to understand how the brain works and how uh, when the brain is broken, it gives rise to various types of disorders, whether they're psychiatric disorders or neurological disorders, we won't really have a clear roadmap for how to develop a next generation of drugs and will continue to rely on lucky accidents. And so arguably the only new drug that's been approved uh, for psychiatry in the last 50 years is ketamine. And there's been a lot of buzz in, uh, in the popular press about ketamine. And again, ketamine's properties as an antidepressant were discovered pretty much by accident because people were using it as a party drug. We don't understand how it works. Um, in many cases, we use it uh, in, in the laboratory as a sedative, not as an antidepressant, which is kind of counterintuitive. And in fact, the only indication that ketamine uh, has been approved for is uh, a very narrow one uh, that involves, I think, intranasal delivery with a spray. That's the only FDA-approved use of ketamine. But there are lots of people paying to have ketamine infusions into their bloodstream every week to the tune of you know an hour uh, a day each week and many many thousands of dollars and we don't know what the long term consequences of these treatments are there've been no clinical trials to evaluate that so uh just just to caution your listeners that if they hear oh ketamine is the great new psychiatric drug it certainly has some promise but there's a lot we have to learn about it and the same thing is true for psychedelics there's been a lot of of uh, uh of hype uh, uh some of it uh justified about uh the potential power of psychedelics for treating psychiatric disorders, but the the scientific studies that would be needed to approve, get FDA approval to use that drug in this way are uh, a long way from being completed. Yeah. So there's just a lot we don't know about how these particular drugs work. And in general, if we take a bird's eye view of neuroscience historically, I think it's fair to say that for most of the history of neuroscience, a lot of the techniques and a lot of the studies that have been done have been largely or even entirely correlational in nature. We could measure certain things about brain activity. We could do imaging studies or EEG studies or what have you, and we could correlate you know, different wiggles in an EEG um, uh, a plot or, or different um, imaging study outputs that we have with what people say they're feeling or what what animals are doing. But a lot of that stuff has been correlational. And you start to talk in your book about this new era of causal neuroscience we're in, where we can actually go in and study cause and effect using new technologies. Can you speak a little bit about what causal neuroscience is and, and what it's actually allowing us to do? Sure. So I think we all know, uh, we've all heard uh, that correlation doesn't imply causation. Uh, just because two things vary together in 
time or in space doesn't mean that one of them causes the other. Uh, uh, they they could be completely independent, or they could be caused by a third thing that you're not measuring. And uh, my favorite example of this is that there's a very strong correlation between ice cream consumption uh, and uh, uh, violence in humans. And <clears throat> that's not because when people commit a violent act, it makes them hungry for ice cream or eating ice cream makes people violent. It's because both violence and ice cream consumption increase in hot weather in the mm -hmm. summertime. And that's why they're correlated with each other. So similarly, if a person is sitting in a brain scanner and they report uh, a subjective feeling of fear or anxiety, and the brain scanner shows at the same time that there is a hot spot of activity somewhere in the brain. That doesn't tell you whether the brain activity is causing the fear, the fear is causing the brain activity, or that neither of them is has a causal influence on each other. And there's some third thing that you're not measuring that is independently causing the brain activity and the feeling of fear in the way that hot weather independently causes violent crime to go up and ice cream consumption to go up. And so that's really the limitation. And if, if you incorrectly infer a causal relationship uh, and try to design an intervention based on that incorrect inference, you're going to fail. So if you decide that ice cream consumption increases violent crime, and so the way to fight violent crime is to ban ice cream, you're going to make a lot of people unhappy, and you're not going to have any effect on violent crime. Uh, and, and, and so that's really why simply having correlational neuroscience, which is primarily what you can do in humans, is not good enough if we want to develop uh, a new generation uh, of therapies and treatments. And so causal neuroscience, uh, by contrast, is a way of knowing that involves going into the brain and perturbing the brain turning parts of the brain or certain cell populations, turning them on when they're not supposed to be on or making them turn on more strongly uh, when they normally are turned on or turning them off. And then asking what is the effect of that perturbation on the behavior of the animal. And so if a perturbation in a particular cell type changes a behavior, then you can say that there is a cause and effect relationship between the brain cells activity and behavior. For example, let's say that you found through correlational studies that in mice, there is a certain population of brain cells that are active when the animal is anxious. And you can tell when a mouse is anxious by putting it in a brightly lit arena, and it will sort of hug the corners and try to stay out of the center. Uh, and again, just like a person in a brain scanner, that's just a correlation. Now, if you were able to access that particular cell type, say it's in a brain structure like the amygdala, and you were able to shut that cell off at will, you could ask whether that manipulation made the animals less anxious. And you could tell that because the animals would stop hugging the corner, the walls of the arena and wander out into the center. Or conversely, you could take a mouse that wasn't anxious that was happily wandering around in the center of the arena and suddenly activate those cells and see if that caused the mouse to become more anxious and to run out to the walls of the arena and stay circling uh, out of the center. If you got results like that, that tells you that it's probably worthwhile to study that in more depth and understand how those cause and effect relationships happen in the brain, because that might help you identify that cell type as a target for new drug development. 
were as if you did the same experiment based on a correlation between anxiety and the activities of some brain cell and nothing that you did to the cell's activity had any effect on the animal's anxiety, you probably wouldn't want to spend a lot of time trying to develop a drug to turn that cell on and off as a treatment for anxiety because you know it won't have any effect. At least it doesn't have an effect in a mouse. And so those sorts of causal neuroscience experiments, they they are not the whole answer by any means. And they've been criticized, not without some justification, for giving uh, an overly simplistic view of causal relationships in the brain. Um, but at least they tell you where to look, even if they don't give you the ultimate answer. And unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, uh, we can't do those experiments in humans, uh, except in very, very rare cases. That is, we cannot stick something into a person's brain that is aimed at disrupting or increasing the activity of a particular brain region or group of cells. We can't do that in any arbitrary brain region and ask how that affects the person's feelings or behavior, because it's not medically justified. The only time we can do that is if there is a medical justification. So, for example, if somebody is in the hospital because they have seizures and a neurologist is poking electrodes in different parts of their brain and stimulating to try to figure out where the seizure focus is so they, they can operate and cut it out, um, they can always ask the person as they're stimulating, well, what did you feel when I did this? What did you feel when I did that? But they can only do that in a very circumscribed region of the brain where they suspect the seizure focus, the site of the seizure may lie. They can't just move the electrode uh, into a different region of the brain that's 10 centimeters away just out of curiosity to see, oh, well, what happens if they stimulate here? They'd have their medical license revoked and the patient could sue them for malpractice. So we're very constrained by our ability to do directed, site-directed perturbations in the human brain. And furthermore, the tools that we have to do that are very crude. They basically involve sticking metal electrodes into the brain, and those electrodes inject current into a brain region in a way that probably activates or inhibits thousands and thousands of cells and comprised of many hundreds of different types of cells. And so we may get highly variable results from one person to the next person, or even in the same person from one day to the next, depending on which cells we're stimulating. So even when we can do their, those experiments, they're sort of blunt instruments. And that's what's really limited our ability to apply causal neuroscience to human neuroscience. So, so historically, even in animals, all you could really do is listen to what some neurons were doing in the brain. Oftentimes, you wouldn't know exactly which neurons you're even listening to. You can watch what an animal is doing. You can correlate the behavior that the animal displays with what you're recording in the neurons. But as you, as you told us, you can't make inferences about cause and effect there, and you're really limited by those correlational observations. But now there are new technologies that enable you, um, people in your lab, people in other labs, to go in and very specifically manipulate individual circuits and neurons in the brain. So you can actually make neurons more active, less active, change the pattern of their activity and do that in a very specific way. I think the principal technique there that some people will have heard of, but many will not have heard of is optogenetics. And so can you give people a quick 101 on optogenetics and how it works? Sure. Uh, I, I, I'm happy to do that. And also to mention a, a related uh, technology, which is called chemogenetics, um, and uh, that that is a different way of doing causal neuroscience experiments, which ultimately may have more immediate applications to humans than as a th on a therapeutic basis than optogenetics will. So, first of all, what's the word 
optogenetics. Opto refers to light and genetics refers to something having to do with genes. Uh, why are those two words uh, put together to make a new word? Uh, and I think that that term was uh, coined by Carl Dyseroth at Stanford, who is one of the leaders in the development of this technology. And what it uh, what it means is to manipulate using light. That's the opto part, the activity of a particular group of neurons and which neurons can be manipulated by light is dictated using genetic tools that allow you to restrict light sensitivity to a particular group of neurons of interest. So that's where the two words come from. But now I have to unpack how you can even make neurons responsive to light. We all know that we have nerve cells in our brains already that normally respond to light. They're in our eye and they lie in the retina and they're called photoreceptors. And those are sensory neurons that respond to light of particular wavelengths uh, by converting the energy of the photons they absorb into an electrical impulse, which they then transmit through a synapse to another cell in the retina. And their ability to do that is due to the fact that they express certain proteins that are called rhodopsins. And these are proteins in our eyes. We have them, uh, um, many, many animals have them. Flies have them. Uh, 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 many uh, mollusks have them. Uh, these are proteins that evolved to absorb a photon and somehow convert the energy of that photon into electricity. And I won't get into the details right now of how that happens. Um, but uh, the, the idea is that if you could import into one of the cells that's deep in your brain that normally doesn't respond to light, like a cell in your cerebral cortex or a cell in your hippocampus, um, if you could implant in that cell one of these rhodopsin-like genes, then in theory, you should make that cell susceptible or sensitive to light. And that would allow you to change the electrical activity of that cell using light. And so that's really the concept behind uh, optogenetics. And actually, the game or the, the trick was to figure out which light absorbing protein, which opsin should you choose from nature to put into neurons that normally are not light responsive to make them light responsive. And in fact, some of the first attempts to do this by Giro Miesenbach in Europe involved using the actual uh, phototransduction light sensing machinery from the vertebrate eye. It hmm. involved putting opsins and some of the other proteins that they talk to, which are called transducins, uh, all into the same neurons. And he was able to show in a sort of proof of principle experiments that you were then able to shine light on those neurons and make those neurons electrically active. Um, the problem with that method is that it was very cumbersome because you had to put not one, not two, but three different genes into the same cell in order to make them light responsive in that way, in order to endow them with the ability to convert light energy into electrical energy. And the more genes you have to put into a cell, a neuron or any kind of cell to do an experiment, the more cumbersome and complicated the experiment is. And so that sort of uh, uh, implementation of optogenetics did not get 
very much traction in the community or wide adoption. What was really critical was the discovery of a different opsin from a different animal. Um, in this case, it's a single-celled alga called Chlamydomonas, which lives in ponds of water, and it has an opsin that allows it to detect blue light and swim towards the light. And so it has a natural protein that detects blue light and converts that into electricity. And in this case, one protein encoded by one gene does the whole trick. And the reason is because when the photon, uh, the light energy particle, hits that protein, which is sitting in the outer membrane of the cell. It causes that protein to change shape in a way that makes it create a pore or a tunnel through the cell's membrane that electrically charged ions can flow through to go into the cell from the outside of the cell. And when that happens, it changes the electrical balance across the cell membrane, and that's enough to make the cell electrically excited. And that in itself was a very important discovery. In fact, Peter Hegman, uh, who was the biochemist in Germany that uh, discovered that uh, the the light sensor and the ion channel were part of a single protein in this channel, so-called channel rhodopsin protein, uh, shared the Lasker Prize in Medical Research last year with Carl Dyseroth, who uh, put that uh, channel rhodopsin gene into neurons and showed that now putting just one gene into a neuron could allow you to make that neuron uh, uh, electrically excitable. So that's the that's the optical part. That's how we can make a neuron that is normally not sensitive to light sensitive to light. Now, what is that good for? Or as my wife always asks, what are you going to do with that? <laughs> uh, and and what you're going to do with that is figure out a clever way to deliver the gene that encodes that opsin protein from the alga channel rhodopsin into a specific group of neurons in the brain using what I would call a genetic zip code or address for those particular neurons. And uh, the first thing that, that your listeners need to know is that there the, the brain is not made of one generic cell type called a neuron. It has probably many thousands of neurons. In fact, the current estimates are about 5,000 different kinds of neurons. And those neurons are different from each other in the proteins that they have and in their shape and in their size and in their connection because they turn on different genes. And it's becoming clear that if you spend enough time understanding the genetic control of the identity of a particular kind of neuron, you may be able to identify a short piece of DNA, which is what I'm calling the genetic zip code or the genetic address. And if you physically glue or physically link that piece of DNA with the piece of DNA that encodes this opsin, channel rhodopsin, the light-sensitive protein, you now have a genetic embodiment of optogenetics. That is, you have a single piece of DNA that contains both the instructions for making a protein that can convert light into electricity and that also contains the genetic instructions of where in what cell type that gene should be turned on. And so if you do that, uh, if you can introduce that into a brain using a, a virus, for example, as a vector, a, a, a defective virus as kind of a disposable molecular syringe is the way I like to think about it, for inserting that gene into the brain, that gene will only 
that gene, meaning the opsin, will only get turned on in the cells that whose address matches the genetic zip code that you put on that piece of DNA. So now you've got an animal that has in a specific set of cells in its brain, uh, a light sensing protein. And uh, what Carl Dyseroth was able to show beyond the fact that you could then turn on such a cell with blue light in a Petri dish is that in an intact brain, you could also turn that cell on with light if you could put an optic fiber cable into the brain and lower it right down to the area where the cells of interest are located and then turn on blue light so that you're now delivering a cone of blue light deep in the brain. And when that cone of blue light hits the cells of interest that have the opsin gene in them because they have the right genetic zip code, those cells will fire and they will activate an entire circuit of interconnected neurons that they are linked to synaptically. And that may produce a particular behavior. Uh, that behavior could be feeding, for example, that behavior could be drinking, it could be fighting, it could be mating. Many labs, including ours, have identified particular populations of cells that will make animals behave in a certain way when you turn them on. Um, an important point, and some neuroscientists even sometimes forget this uh, particularly systems neuroscientists, is that optogenetics is not just about turning neurons on with light. You can also use it to turn neurons off with light by putting a different kind of opsin in the cell. And this is an opsin that absorbs a different wavelength of light, yellow light. And when it absorbs yellow light, it pumps negatively charged ions, chloride uh, uh, atoms, basically chloride ions into the cell. And that makes the cell more electrically negative than the outside uh, uh, of the cell. And that silences the neuron. So it's the same sort of delivery method. It involves genetic zip codes. It involves molecular biology to cut and paste pieces of DNA together, package them into these viruses, inject the virus into the brain, stick an optic fiber into the brain over the region where you injected the virus, and now flick on a blue light or flick on a yellow light to turn those neurons on to or to turn those neurons off. Wow. So yeah, this is an amazing technique um, that's been around for a number of years now. So in other words, what you've just said is there are ways today that scientists can take a light sensitive protein that nature evolved in other creatures for, for natural reasons. We can take the, the gene encoding this protein, we can package it in a way and literally inject or put it into an animal um, through, through other engineering methods such that specific neurons in the brain express this light sensitive protein and then using a fiber optic or some other piece of hardware you can shine light into the brain of an animal like a mouse and thereby control these neurons by turning them up turning them down or changing their pattern and so you're using light in combination with molecular techniques to manipulate specific neurons in the brain yep that's exactly right and there's as i said uh, at the outset there's a related technology called chemogenetics um, which was independently developed uh, by Brian Roth at the University of North Carolina. And that technology is conceptually similar to optogenetics, except that instead of engineering your favorite neuron to express a light sensitive protein, you engineer them to express a drug sensitive protein. And that drug sensitive protein has the property that when you feed the animal the drug and the drug binds to that receptor, that also changes the electrical activity of the cell. And there are different flavors of the receptor, some that when they bind the drug, turn the cell on, and others that when they bind the drug, turn the cell off, much as there are different types of opsins that detect different wavelengths of light that turn the cell on or turn the cell off. And the these methods have different strengths and weaknesses. 
he, the optogenetics gives you millisecond time resolution over the rate of firing of the neuron. And you, you can decide exactly how fast you want to fire the neuron. But it's also, if you think about it uh, from the standpoint of human applications, it's very invasive. It requires drilling a hole in the brain, inserting a glass optic fiber into the brain, which is delicate. It could break off, connecting that to a power pack and a laser, which is strapped to the patient. And nobody has done that, and no one is going to do that for a long time. Whereas chemogenetics, there's still an invasive component in that you have to inject into the brain the virus that encodes the drug-sensing protein. But the advantage is once you've done that surgery once, you simply have to essentially give the animal a pill or give them an injection to turn those neurons on or turn those neurons off. So there's no glass fiber in the brain. There's no battery pack. There's no laser. Uh, there's just delivering a drug just like you would deliver any other drug to an animal, except that because you've genetically manipulated cells to have a special receptor for this drug, the only cells in the brain that that drug can act on are the ones that you have genetically engineered to be sensitive to it. And that technology will probably be the first or something like it will be the first technology uh, um, that is used if and when uh, we get around to developing um, what people call circuit uh, cures for brain disorders. That is where the target of the therapy is not a single molecule, as it often is with a drug, but the target of the therapy is a cell or even a circuit involving several different cell types. And I would love to give people a, a concrete example of optogenetics in action. So, David, if you don't mind, what I'd like to do now is I will share a video that you supplied me, and maybe I'll describe what I see initially um, as if I was watching this for the first time, and then we'll have you walk people through what's going on, and I'll loop it a couple more times as you're doing that. Sure. So, I'm going to share this video here. Okay, so I'm going to hit play. We see two mice. One of them is chasing the other one. They look like they're fighting each other. One of them is attacking it. And then this light came on and they stopped suddenly. So David, I'm going to play a couple more times, but what exactly is going on here? So what is happening here is that um, there's two mice in the cage. One of the mice uh, lives in the cage. He's called the resident. And the other mouse is uh, the intruder. It's a mice that we drop into the cage. And mice are very territorial. These are male mice. And so if you put a strange intruder mouse into a cage uh, with a resident in it, the resident will uh, very quickly uh, chase it and attack it. Sort of like if two people are walking their dogs on the street and the dogs meet each other and they decide they don't like each other, they start fighting. Uh, that's what's happening here. And what we have done to the resident mouse is we've used optogenetics to express the kind of opsin that will turn a cell off when it absorbs light. We've expressed it in a group of neurons that we discovered in a, a region of the brain called the hypothalamus that uh, evidently control aggressive behavior. And so that mouse, the resident mouse, has already had a virus injected into its brain and has a fiber optic cable embedded in its brain. This doesn't hurt because there's no pain receptors inside the brain. Uh, and that Opti that cable is connected to a laser that emits yellow light. And so we wait for the resident to attack the intruder. And when we flick on the yellow light, we are instantaneously shutting off this particular population of neurons deep in the brain, in the hypothalamus. And what that does is it stops the fight 
dead in its tracks. So imagine if you had something like this in your dog and you were walking your dog and it encountered another dog being walked and decided to attack that dog and you're trying to pull them apart by your Le their leashes and you can't do it because the dogs are too strong. Imagine you could just flick a switch and uh, turn on a laser and it would immediately stop your dog from attacking like that. Uh, that's basically what we've done here in a mouse. And so how did you, so, so, so you've got two mice in the video, we saw one mouse had, you know, a wire coming out of its head and that's, you know, where the light is being delivered through a fiber optic into the brain, into the structure called the hypothalamus that you mentioned. Where is the hypothalamus? How old is the structure in evolutionary terms? And how do neuroscientists think about what the hypothalamus does at a very basic level compared to something like, uh, say, the cerebral cortex? Right. So the hypothalamus is at the base of the brain uh it's it's sort of almost above the roof of your mouth in in the brain uh as it is in uh in rodents and uh all vertebrate species have something like a hypothalamus uh fish have a hypothalamus birds have a hypothalamus turtles have a hypothalamus and so do uh, uh mice and monkeys and humans um and so it's a very evolutionarily ancient structure and it's known to control a lot of important visceral functions like feeding and drinking and temperature regulation and in it does some of that by uh, uh, releasing hormones that go into the brain or into the bloodstream. And so uh, at, at one point, the, uh, the hypothalamus was sort of viewed as kind of the pancreas of the brain, uh, sort of like a secretory structure in the brain that squirts hormones into your bloodstream that control whether you're hungry or thirsty. And if you're hungry, they make you eat. If they're thirsty, they make you drink. But we now know that uh, the hypothalamus is not just a secretory organ in the brain, but it's actually a complicated and sophisticated network of neurons that are connected to each other. Uh, and different neurons in that network control different types of behaviors, and they do so with enough specificity that if you find people have found the neurons that control eating and when they optogenetically stimulate those neurons, it can make a mouse that's completely satiated eat ravenously. Uh, they found similar neurons that make mice drink when you turn them on. Um, we've, as, as you've shown, we found uh, neurons that are necessary for fighting behavior and which can cause an animal to attack something it normally wouldn't when you turn them on. We've done the same thing for mating. And so there, there seem to be very dedicated behavior-specific groups of neurons in that part of the brain to control behaviors that are critical for the animal's survival. Um, and, and we like to think of these uh, as the, uh, uh, the four Fs, feeding uh, freezing, fighting, and mating. And <laughs> I'll let your uh, uh, listeners decide what the fourth F is, because um, I can't say it on the air. But um, in contrast, you asked about the cerebral cortex, the prevailing view of the cerebral cortex is more like it's a sort of general purpose computer. It's like a central processing unit that you have in your laptop. It can run many different kinds of applications, it can be multi-purposed to do many things, and uh, it, it's a much more sophisticated device computationally in in this uh, in this view than the neurons that are in uh, in the hypothalamus that are in the sort of basement of your brain, if you will. And so that's the that that in a in a very uh, 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 overly simplistic way is is the distinction between how people think about the cerebral cortex versus the hypothalamus uh, and and roughly what the hypothalamus does. Mm -hmm. So in that video we watched, you've got light shining into the hypothalamus. 
you've got certain cells in the hypothalamus of the mouse that are expressing this light sensitive protein. And in, and in the case of that video, you're shutting them off mm -hmm. and the behavior, the aggression behavior stops. Right. So we're in a structure that's deep in the brain. It's very ancient. It's in all all types of animals. And it does, it's associated with behaviors that we think of as, as visceral or basic or instinctive, things like feeding and, and fighting and mating and so forth. Now, you mentioned that there's different kinds of neurons associated with different behaviors that um, you can stimulate or turn off. There's ones associated with feeding specifically, with drinking specifically, with aggression specifically, and so on and so forth. How did you identify the particular population of neurons in this case that have to do with aggression? What was the molecular marker associated with those neurons and why is that significant? Right. So uh, the way that we uh, identified those neurons is first to do uh, a correlational experiment, getting back to your first question, where uh, we could take mice that fought and look inside their brains. And we had to do this uh, in, in slices through the mouse brain. So the mice had to be sacrificed for this experiment after they fought. But um, we stained those brain slices uh, with a, uh, um, uh, a chemical that uh, lights up individual neurons that have been active just before the mouse was sacrificed. So if the mouse was fighting uh, just before it was sacrificed, then you see the cells that were active during fighting lighting up. And that showed us that in a particular region of the hypothalamus, there was a group of cells that got very active when the animal was fighting. It wasn't the only place in the brain where we saw that, uh, but it was in uh, a part of the brain that was suspected to be involved in this behavior from uh, more classical studies that had been done decades before in cats and in rats. And so then what we tried to do is to ask, can we find a genetic zip code for those neurons? Can we find a gene that marks those neurons and not other neurons that are intermingled with it in that region, which are not activated during aggression? And we did that by trial and error. We just combined staining the slices to visualize the active neurons and with staining them with a different color tag that identified a particular gene. And so the gene tag was red, the activity tag was green. We, when they're both in the same cell, the cell looks yellow. And so we tested lots of different genes and asked which ones gave us the most yellow cells after the animal was fighting and didn't show yellow cells in animals that weren't fighting or that were mating or doing something else. And uh, uh, surprisingly, at least to us, uh, the gene that we turned up that looked the, uh, to be the best candidate uh, was an estrogen receptor. I say an estrogen receptor because there are two. This is the type 1 estrogen receptor. And I can come back uh, later on, if you're interested, to the question of why aggression neurons should express an estrogen receptor. But right now, you can just think of it as a gene that marks those cells. And so through genetic trickery, then we were able to use the zip code uh, uh, from, from that gene, the estrogen receptor gene, to genetically address the light-sensitive opsin to the neurons in that region of the brain. And uh, when we did that, and when we used an opsin, actually the first time we did the experiment, in, instead of shutting the neurons off, we uh, used the opsin that turned the neurons on. And we asked if that would make the, the mice attack something that they would not normally attack, uh, like a female mouse or even an inanimate object like an inflated uh, latex glove. And we found that it could do that. So these were very powerful cells. And uh, here you're showing a movie uh, uh, of stimulating those cells 
uh, in a mouse which is now attacking a latex glove. So when the light is on in the upper left corner there in the movie, it means that the laser is on and we are stimulating these cells. And the mouse goes from investigating the rubber glove to actually biting it and uh, uh, and attacking it, uh, which is which is very striking. And so uh, that's that's how we identified those cells and importantly in later experiments we we showed uh in in a, in a control experiment that if we deliberately tried to activate the neighboring cells that didn't have the estrogen receptor in them then we didn't get fighting when we activated those cells so if you think of these different cell types as a mixture of salt and pepper crystals in this region of the brain and the estrogen receptor marks the salt and the the pepper neurons don't have the estrogen receptor we only got attack when we activated the salt neurons not when we activated the pepper neurons and that made it possible for us to very reproducibly and deliberately activate uh, this group of neurons. And, and I should say that this, we, we, these experiments started over 10 years ago. Um, and, uh, uh, it, we sort of take for granted. I think many neuroscientists take for granted that, oh, yes, if you look for neurons in the brain that control something like aggression, you're going to find them somewhere. Uh, but, that wasn't always the way that people thought about aggression. In fact, in the 1940s uh, and uh, 50s, there was a lot of uh, this so-called nature-nurture debate going on, uh, specifically with respect to aggression and brain-stimulated aggression. And the question was whether uh, animals had to learn and have a, a part of their brain instructed by experience to make it aggressive, or whether animals were born with particular neurons in their brain that were pre-programmed to produce aggression when they were stimulated. And while it was true that in the late 1920s, experiments done in cats by Walter Hess showed that you could make a cat aggressive by sticking metal electrodes into its hypothalamus and stimulating. There were a couple of different regions where he could get a similar result. And because these were cats that were basically caught on the streets of Zurich, as far as I can tell, <laughs> and brought into his laboratory, that's before there were any animal research regulations, you really couldn't, you didn't know what the life history of the cat was mm. and whether it had learned a lot of fighting while growing up on the streets of Zurich. Uh, and if so, whether that whether uh, Dr. Hess happened to be lucky enough to hit a region where the animal's brain had learned to control aggression. Uh, and what our experiment showed really, if nothing else, is that that idea is wrong and that Every mouse has this group of estrogen receptor neurons in its brain, and that if you stimulate those neurons, you're going to get attack. It's not different from one mouse to the next. Uh, if you stimulate those neurons in a different mouse, it's not going to make them eat instead of attacking, or it's not going to make them drink instead of attacking. It really is a hardwired population of neurons that appears to be dedicated to the control of aggression. And I think that is the sort of most basic conclusion from those types of studies. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just a dramatic result. I mean, you can turn aggression on at the flip of a switch. You can turn aggression off when it's happening naturally. You're doing it by manipulating this particular population of neurons in the hypothalamus that is marked by its expression of one of the estrogen receptors in the brain, and it's different from other neurons that are right next to it in the hypothalamus that are involved in other behaviors. I want to talk a little bit about the significance of the estrogen receptor here as a marker for these neurons. Um, if I try and, you know, if we met, uh, when we speak um, in everyday speech, you know, people often reference hormones. They'll say things like, you know, teenagers are filled with hormones, and this is why they do 
crazy things or take high risk behaviors or, or erratic. They might reference, you know, a, a woman who is going through a pregnancy or different phases of her menstrual cycle and that her behavior is quote unquote due to hormones. Mm-hmm. But what exactly are hormones? And how do they work to influence our behavior? And why is the hypothalamus sort of a, a very important brain structure for connecting those dots? Right. Those are those are great and very important questions. So hormones are a type of chemical that circulates in our bodies, and they, they can come in different classes or different forms. People have probably heard of steroids. That's There's a group of steroid hormones, and then there are also peptides, peptide hormones. So insulin is an example of a peptide hormone, and estrogen and testosterone are examples of steroid hormones. Uh, What these hormones do in the case of the steroid hormones is that they're able to cross the blood brain barrier and get into the brain. And then some of the cells in the brain, like the ones that uh, express the estrogen receptor, what that receptor is, is a protein molecule in that neuron that is a docking site for the hormone. So the hormone goes into lots of different cells. It crosses their membrane and it it goes into the cell. And if the cell isn't expressing the right receptor, the hormone doesn't do anything. It just hangs around until it gets degraded or it goes back out of the cell. But if the cell has the receptor for the hormone, the hormone docks to the receptor, sort of like the little space shuttle docking with the space station at the beginning of 2001. And then the space station, which is the hormone receptor, turns on or turns off many genes in that same cell. And the turning on or off of those genes can make that cell more active, less active. It can make it grow. Uh, It can make it shrink. It can even make it survive and prevent it from dying, or in some cases, it could kill it. So these hormones are extremely powerful because they affect very specific groups of neurons in the brain. And the effects that they have on those neurons are very profound in the way they're able to shape uh, uh, shape the activity of those neurons and therefore affect the behavior those neurons control. So, so hormones are literally going through the bloodstream into the brain and directly affecting neurons in, in various ways. That's right. And was it surprising that the estrogen receptor and an estrogen receptor was the marker you found for these aggression neurons? Um, in in retrospect, it shouldn't have been surprising had we uh, been uh, more sophisticated in our knowledge of this region of the brain. Um, but like many people in in uh, in the lay community, we assumed that if any hormone, steroid hormone, has something to do with aggression, it must be testosterone. We mm. assume that testosterone is the male hormone. Uh, when you have more testosterone, you're more aggressive, and estrogen is the female hormone. And if anything, it should make females less aggressive so that they can mate and take care of their young and offspring and raise them. So estrogen is responsible for all the good things that animals do and testo- and people, and testosterone is responsible for all the bad things that people do. Um, and it turns out that that's way too simplistic. And many, uh, it's been known for, for actually for decades that even in males, the actions, a lot of the actions of testosterone are mediated not through its own receptor, which is called the androgen receptor. It's a receptor in, uh, um, in, uh, in that binds to testosterone, but testosterone can also be chemically converted in the brain to estrogen in a very simple chemical reaction. And then the estrogen can bind to the estrogen receptor and exert particular uh, effects. So for example, it's uh, it's been known that if you 
chemically, if you, if you surgically castrate a rodent, uh, a male, it will lose the ability to fight. And of course, if you give it back testosterone, it'll regain the ability to fight. But you can also give it back the ability to fight by giving it estrogen instead of testosterone, because you're just bypassing the requirement that for the brain to convert the testosterone into estrogen. So estrogen is very important for uh, and th this is not all our work. This is work uh, in many labs, uh, including uh, Nirao Shah, who's a former student of mine now at Stanford. Uh, estrogen, somewhat paradoxically, plays a key role in masculinizing the mammalian brain. Hmm. Um, it's released shortly after birth in a peak, and that release of estrogen is critical to set up the circuits in the male brain that control male be specific behaviors and male aggression. And then others have shown that in the adult even, uh, estrogen receptor in this region of the hypothalamus is necessary for mice to fight. If you hmm. genetically knock out that estrogen receptor in that region of the hypothalamus, the uh, cells, the, the animals don't fight. So you need the estrogen both developmentally in order to construct a masculinized nervous system, and you also need it functionally in the adult to allow those neurons to uh, uh, function correctly uh, in aggression. And conversely, in females, it's been known uh, since the late 70s from uh, work from Donald Pfaff that uh, in the, the region of the female brain, the analogous region of the female brain, there are cells that control mating behavior that also have the estrogen receptor in them. But there are different kind of neuron from the neurons that control aggression, uh, as we and others have recently shown. So even in the same brain region, in there are not only in one sex, some neurons that respond to estrogen and some that don't, but if you compare the two sexes, males and females, there are different kinds of estrogen responsive neurons in the female brain and in the male brain. Mm -hmm. And you know, one thing that I think that that strikes me here about hormones is they are probably not only controlling neurons like the ones you just described in order to affect behaviors like this, but I imagine they're also coordinating physiological processes throughout the body. So for example, you know, when the aggressive mouse gets aggressive, it needs to have the motor output of aggression that we're watching in the video, but it also needs to you know, be sending more blood flow to its muscles. It probably needs to have its pupils dilated, things like this. So are, are hormones acting, how, to what extent are they acting locally versus sort of globally throughout different tissues to coordinate all of these different systems? So there's definitely actions of the sex steroids outside the brain. For example, testosterone builds muscle tissue. That's why weightlifters often take testosterone to do that. And by the way, uh, when they do that, they often develop uh, female secondary sex characteristics uh, like breasts. And that's because they're taking all this testosterone and a lot of it is getting converted into estrogen and estrogen mm. makes breast cells grow in males as well as in females. So those weightlifters also take aromatase inhibitors, which are drugs that prevent testosterone from being converted into estrogen so that they can have big muscles and no breasts. Um, and that indicates this intimate relationship between these two sex steroids, testosterone and estrogen, uh, and the fact that we have drugs that can block this conversion. So uh, I, I, yes, there are effects of these hormones in the body uh, on tissues like muscle tissue, breast tissue, and there are also indirect effects. You mentioned pupil dilation, heart rate, uh, those sorts of things, uh, functions are uh, mainly attributed to so-called fight or flight hormones like adrenaline. Mm. 
which are released from the brain and also from the body uh, during uh, conditions where the animal is stressed. And they're released from a type of neurons called sympathetic neurons that are outside of the brain and the spinal cord, but which get input from the brain, including from the hypothalamus and the regions of the hypothalamus that are sensitive to estrogen. So this is a way that estrogen acting on cells in the brain can affect cells outside the brain that release fight or flight hormones like uh, um, uh, uh, um uh, epinephrine, adrenaline, um, that can make your heart beat faster, increase your blood circulation, make your pupils dilate, and do the, all of the other things that you need to do if you're fighting or fleeing. Mm -hmm. Now, one always in science tries to resist the impulse to anthropomorphize. Um, but on the other hand, you just can't help it when you see some of these videos. So when I think about the aggression neurons being turned on in the mouse that then attacks the latex glove, uh, is the mouse feeling pissed off? And how do you how do you even start to think about what might be going on there in terms of the emotional experience that might be had by the mouse? Right. So that that is the uh, I guess in these days it would be the sixty four million dollar question, not the sixty four thousand dollar question. Um, and that is, does the mouse feel anything? when it is engaged in these behaviors and if so what is it feeling is it an angry mouse is it pissed off or is it a happy mouse because it has a chance to beat somebody up and it it gets reinforcement from feeling like it's the champion um we're just beginning to get glimpses uh of answers to those questions and they're very hard to ask First of all, the whole question of whether a mouse or indeed any animal is feeling something is something that we can't really ask right now experimentally in an animal in an objective way. And that's because feelings are something that as humans, we determine or identify by introspection. If somebody asks you how you're feeling, you sort of think about, okay, what 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 am I sensing in my body, in my brain? Am I happy? Am I sad? It's a very private experience, the subjective feeling. Uh, we can ask people how they feel because people can talk. But, you know, somebody, a person can lie about their feelings. They can be angry and say they're not angry. Uh, and if they're not fighting, you don't know it if they can keep a poker face. Um, so even a uh, verbal report is flawed as a way of assessing feelings in humans. But animals can't talk. And so we can't ask a mouse, are you feeling angry when you uh, are, are fighting? But we can ask whether there are things going on in the brain besides just the control of going through the motions of attacking. In other words, we can ask whether this attack behavior is just a robotic reflex or whether there is some underlying state, a drive state or motive state that propels the animal to commit aggression or perform aggression. And that maybe that's whether the mouse feels or is aware of that state or not, we don't know. I'm not saying that mice can't feel anything. I'm just saying we don't have a objective scientific way to test that, but they may still have a state in them that we can measure uh, that tells us that there's something more than just motor reflexes going on. The extreme example is when I was a kid, there was a, a toy that you could buy called Rock'em Sock'em Robots. And these were little robots and you wound them up and they would fight with each other. And I don't think anybody would attribute feelings of anger uh, to those robots. Um, and so clearly one can observe fighting behavior in something that 
looks like uh, an organism that's man-made, um, but which isn't feeling anything or having any internal state. So the way I think of the relationship between feelings and internal states or emotion states is I imagine the whole state package as an iceberg floating in the ocean, and the tip of the iceberg is the feeling part which is hmm. what we can measure in humans, but we can't measure it in animals. But there's a whole big part of the iceberg that is submerged below the tip, which is something that we have and also that we think we share with a lot of animals, which is the the emotional state that is driving the behavior. And we can study that without having to worry about whether the animal is feeling uh, a sense of anger. And so how do, how do we do that? Um, there are some indirect tests that people use to assess motivation. Uh, and so a classic test in experimental psychology uh, is to test for motivation is to see if an animal will do work to obtain something. Uh, if it does, that something is considered rewarding to the animal uh, or it's considered a reinforcer. So um, if an animal is starved, you can teach it to press a bar to get a food reward. And the more it presses the bar, once it's learned to do that, you can control how many times the animal has to press the bar to get its food reward. And so when you start, the animal only has to press the bar once and it gets a pellet of food. That's very easy. And a very hungry mouse and a not so hungry mouse will both learn to press the bar once. But if you change the rules of the game, and you make it necessary for the animal to press the bar five times or 10 times or 15 times, a not so hungry mouse will eventually give up, presumably in frustration. It, it simply doesn't, it's simply not motivated strongly enough to keep pressing the bar because it's not that hungry. But a mouse that's been starved for a long time will press the bar as many times as necessary in order to get that reward. So psychologists define a motivational state, or in this case, a food-seeking state, as a state that you can measure by this type of bar pressing or nose poking test. Now, you can't do that when an, a mouse is fighting because it needs a whole apparatus uh, with bars and nose pokes and lights and sound. And you can't interrupt the mouse when it's in the middle of a fight and say, excuse me, could you just stop fighting for a minute and go over here and poke your nose in this hole and tell me how many times you want to poke your nose and then I'll let you go back to fighting again. Um, once it's begun fighting, it is uh, sort of past the point of no return. But you can test the motivation of the animal to fight or to seek out the opportunity to fight. Uh, and this was done uh, um, originally uh, by Klaus Michek in uh, at Tufts University and others uh, who showed that mice will actually learn to press a bar or poke their nose to get the opportunity to beat up a weaker subordinate mouse. <laughs> so you train the mouse by having a light go on. When the light goes on, mouse knows that it is supposed to decide whether to poke its nose or not poke. And you train it that every time it pokes its nose, you drop into the cage a weakling subordinate mouse and you let the resident mouse of the cage have at it an attack, and then you do it again and again and again. And eventually the mouse learns that when the light comes on, if it pokes its nose, it will get the opportunity to attack another mouse. Now, so that's been shown in, 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 in a number of studies that mice and rats will learn to do that. And ordinarily, we don't think of attacking as rewarding. 
We think of aggression as something that is negative, that is associated with feelings of fear, frustration, harassment, anger, rage. But there are forms of aggression that uh, are reinforcing um, somebody, a prize fighter that wins uh, a boxing match is is going to feel uh, uh, victorious and reinforced for having won the boxing match. And it looks like that if there is any internal drive or emotion state that is associated with that type of aggression in mouse, and I say type because there's many different types of aggression in mice, just like there are in people, but at least that type of aggression, if the mouse wins, uh, seems to be rewarding to the animal. Now, we can't say from those experiments whether the act of attacking and biting the other mouse is really rewarding to the mouse, uh, or whether it's just the defeat of the other mouse and the establishment of dominance over that mouse, Mm. which is rewarding. I suspect it is probably the latter, but it's very hard to show that uh, experimentally. Um, But uh, that the fact that the animal will learn and do work for the opportunity to engage in that kind of aggression suggests that the animal, that's something the animal wants to do because he finds it rewarding or reinforcing. Um, Whether there are forms of aggression where the animal is in a state that is more analogous to what we would uh, label as rage or anger uh, is something that we're very interested in and uh, are trying to find out. And it has to do, it gets back to this issue of different types of aggression. So the type of aggression that the animal will learn to poke its nose for and that it finds rewarding um, that we think of in the field as offensive aggression, or you can think of it as proactive aggression. The animal is starting the fight because it wants to win. Whereas the type of fighting behavior that uh, uh, is we associate with anger and rage in humans, you can think of as defensive aggression or reactive aggression. It's the type of aggression that we engage in if we're threatened or uh, if somebody makes us angry or if we're trying to uh, protect or defend uh, a resource Uh, or a loved one. And there is good evidence in rats that there are both proactive and reactive offensive and defensive forms of aggression. It's been harder to define that in mice, but I think that uh, if there is a clearly definable form of reactive or defensive aggression, that might be the type of aggression that has an internal state that is uh, has a negative valence that is unpleasant to the animal and that the animal is fighting to get rid of that unpleasant state rather than to gain a state that is uh, a pleasant or reinforcing state. Mm-hmm. So it's a long-winded question, answer, which we always give in science when we don't know the answer. So, <laughs> um, so you mentioned uh a phrase, a term a moment ago, valence. So you can have mm-hmm. an experience that has a negative valence that the animal doesn't like having. It can have a positive valence. The animal does like having it. At a fairly high level, why why would nature want to evolve nervous systems that are coupling motor commands and motor outputs and and motivated behavior with these types of emotional states? What does that have to do with learning and memory and how a brain is working in order to motivate an animal to do something or not do something? Right. Uh, so <clears throat> that that is a, is a deep and an important question. And uh, one, one answer to that question is um, if you imagine that animals evolved to be robots um, that were like a the the uh, unmanned 
uh, uh, rovers that we have on Mars. I mean, we can design robots that will drive around Mars. They will decide whether to turn right or to turn left. They will decide whether to keep trying to drive over a rock, or if it's too big, they'll back off and try another route. So they're able to make decisions and exhibit motor behaviors, locomotor behaviors. They stop, they go. But all of those behaviors are hardwired into the system by the engineers that built the robot, which means that the system doesn't have much flexibility because all it can do is whatever the engineers programmed it to do. And if it encounters, uh, while it's driving around Mars, a signal or an experience that the uh, engineers didn't anticipate, it won't know with quotes how to respond. And it could flip over and break or get stuck or something like that. So what I'm trying to say is that what internal states emotion and motivation states do is they give animals' brains more flexibility in deciding how to respond to particular signals that they get in their environment. They are not just a series of hardwired connections where if this wire gets triggered, then the animal is always going to do X. And if that wire is triggered, the animal is always going to do Y. So one analogy I've used to think about emotion states in the brain is to think of them kind of like one of those old-fashioned telephone switchboard systems where uh, that you see in the movies now, where you have a bunch of operators sitting at tables. And when a call comes in, they unplug a wire from one socket, and then they plug it into another socket to make a particular connection. So there's a lot of flexibility in which wire can be plugged into which, which socket. And it's sort of a clearinghouse for taking information in and then deciding, if you will, uh, what to do with that information and how to route it. And so I think that's what these emotion states do. It, they endow animals with the capacity of their brains, with the capacity of flexible routing. That is, they can take information that comes into their brain and flexibly route that information to produce different behaviors according to where they find themselves at the moment, the context, what happened to them before, their experience, what they think might happen to them in the future, uh, and uh, also their physiological state. Are they hungry? Are they thirsty? Are they tired? Are they hot? Are they, are they cold? Uh, et cetera. So that's really uh, the best way I can answer uh, that type of, uh, of sort of teleological question. Why evolve these sorts of states? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think an intimately related question is just, you know, how you start to think about why evolution would produce any animals that have any conscious awareness um, at all. It, it gets it gets at some of the things you were just saying, but, you know, when you think about the correlation between the emotional states that you're talking about and that you're trying to study in mice and other animals and the need for behavioral flexibility you know when, when we just look at our own experience as humans the most intense conscious awareness is always associated with things that require a lot of attention and a lot of choice between a menu of options um, it requires a lot of behavioral flexibility mm -hmm. and so the conscious awareness piece seems to be very much tied up with the emotion piece of this so do you how do you separate conceptually or do you separate conceptually conscious awareness and the feeling of emotion and to what extent in what ways are are, are these things related to behavioral flexibility and, and how you think about the evolution of consciousness per se okay so that's that's also it's a multi-faceted question uh and 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 very profound one i'm not sure i'm going to be able to answer all of it, but uh, I'll, I'll try to, to touch on some of it. Um, first of all, the relationship between conscious awareness and emotional feeling. Uh, I think about, uh, and many of my colleagues think about, as I said earlier, feelings are subjective states that we are consciously aware of. So from that perspective, emotional feelings 
require conscious awareness. But that doesn't mean that we can't have emotions that we're not consciously aware of. I mean, many of us have probably had the experience of, you know, a significant other looking at us and saying, what's wrong? And we say, what do you mean, what's wrong? Well, you have this concerned expression on your face. Oh, I do? I didn't think I had any expression on my face at all. That's that's a sort of uh, um, anecdotal example of what I would call an unconscious emotion. And that's been replicated and formally demonstrated under controlled laboratory settings now that you can find evidence of emotion states in the way that people will respond to a particular stimulus, say an angry face or a fearful face, even if the people don't report being consciously aware of that state. So that makes it, I think that to me is good evidence that that supports the idea that when we use the word emotion, we're referring to the state. When we use the word feeling, we're referring to the conscious awareness or subjective experience of that state. Now, not everybody agrees with me because in colloquial speech and everyday speech, we use the word emotion and feeling interchangeably. So when we say emotion in everyday speech, we mean feeling, but scientifically these things are distinct. And right now feelings are something you can only study in humans because you can ask a human how you feel. But since you can have emotions without having any feelings, then there are ways you can study those uh, in animals. And the the emotion states, I think, play a key role in controlling behavioral flexibility and behavioral decisions. And this gets into a very sticky, very sticky question of free will. Uh, when you when you do something and you make a choice under a certain set of circumstances, you have a as a people we have a feeling of agency. We made the choice and then we behave that way. Uh, but there are data that suggest that our brains can actually make choices before we even have a conscious awareness of the fact that they have done that and made that choice in in analogous to uh, what I said earlier, that people can have emotions that they're not even aware of uh, or, or consciously feeling. Um, and, and so I would say that you could view the sort of uh, feeling part, the sense of agency and conscious awareness of a flexible decision-making as an epiphenomenon. It's something that your brain makes you think you have control of, but you don't really have control of it. It's happening after the fact of the actual decision. And the decision is being made in your brain much the way the decision is being made in an animal that doesn't uh, necessarily have a uh, conscious awareness of its choices. Although, as I said, uh, we, we should be agnostic about that and not negate it. Um, so that's one point of view. That is that feelings are just sort of epiphenomena. They don't guide flexible behaviors, but uh, that sort of negates free will. Uh, if you If you accept the concept of free will, at least in humans, and then, then uh, that incorporates the idea that conscious experience and conscious feelings uh, are something that goes into decisions that we make when our brain is calculating, should we do X or should we do Y? Is X going to make me feel good or feel better than if I do Y uh, uh, and, uh, or vice versa? Uh, and so... It could be that there is a role for consciousness, at least in humans, conscious awareness in guiding choices uh, through a, a sense of agency, but that is not necessarily true. And if you you ask the question, well, why why should consciousness 
have evolved. And there, again, there is a debate. And that is, is, is consciousness a biological function that arose in evolution through natural selection, like the function of your kidney or the function of your heart uh, or the ability of your brain to control drinking and eating? Or uh, is consciousness sort of a inevitable byproduct of a neural system when it gets sufficiently complicated, when it has enough nodes, enough wires, enough feedback, enough connections. And there are models of consciousness that have been proposed by Giulio Tononi uh, that uh, um, basically define consciousness in terms of this complexity of the system. So you can ask, well, if it's a byproduct and evolution didn't necessarily select for it, um, why should we have it? Well, it's off, there, there are many examples where evolution will select for one function that an organ or a tissue uh, or a system in your body is doing, and then something else that is uh, very tightly connected comes along for the ride as it were, and is also selected in evolution, not because it provided the immediate selective benefit to the animal, but because it was tied to something else that provided the selective benefit to the animal. And that's, I know that's a sort of abstract and, and complicated question, but if you think of systems in our body, whether they're physiological systems, functional systems, as, as being chains of mechanisms that are connected to each other, uh, and, and a particular mechanism like your digestive system or how you, uh, 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 how you do a particular action, um, has many different moving parts and it may be that evolution and selection pressure acted on one of the of those parts in this interconnected chain uh cuz that provided an advantage in a particular when that part played a role in another process cuz it's connected into another chain as well but once it is selected for all other things that it's chained to get selected as well, because they're sort of joined at the hip. And that's one way of thinking about the evolution of consciousness, that it's sort of joined at the hip to having a very complicated brain with many, many wires and many, many connections, but uh, that we might be, there, there are animals that might be able to function perfectly well without consciousness. And we can't answer that question right now because we have no objective way of knowing uh, if an animal is conscious or not or aware or not. Are there any good examples of an instance where you have something selected for in, in the physiology of an organism where this other thing comes along for the ride that isn't necessarily adaptive or wasn't the thing that was selected for? Um, there are, but I'm blanking on them right now. And the person who has written about this extensively is Stephen Jay Gould, the evolutionary biologist. And so I would refer your listeners to his writings uh, to uh, if they're interested in this um, particular phenomenon. And I'm sure it also has a technical term for it. I'm not an evolutionary biologist, uh, so I don't remember that, but that would be uh, uh, that would be one place to find these examples. But there are there are many examples that are believed to have evolved that way by sort of piggybacking or being joined at the hip to something that did have a selective advantage. Yeah, I mean, one thing that sort of comes to mind, I'm not quite sure how well this works, is um, humans are very prone to choking. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is, um, you know, what was very strongly selected for was our ability to speak to each other. And I'm not an expert in this, but that that involved a lot of uh, evolutionary change in our throats to give us the, just the morphological capability to make speech sounds. Mm -hmm. And a natural consequence of 
of uh, creating an animal with the physical ability to speak like that, in addition to the the cognitive ability to do it, is it made us prone to choking. And we can, you know, we can breathe through our mouths, but really our nose is what's for breathing. Mm -hmm. And mouth breathing, I guess, looks like it would be selected for, but it's basically just a side effect of making an animal with the throat capable of speech. And that just, there's no way to hook that up without leaving us prone to these other things or, or using our mouth in ways that aren't, uh, aren't really what it was evolved to do. Yep. I mean, so I think that's a fair point. And whether that applies to consciousness or not is really open to debate. I'm sure there are many people that feel that our, our, the consciousness that we have is, and our ability to have subjective feelings is critical to our decision making. And that if we didn't have those conscious feelings, then we wouldn't be able to function. Um, and that may be true or not be able to function at the level of sophistication that we do. But animals are pretty sophisticated and, uh, uh, which means that either you can, an animal can do a lot even if it doesn't have conscious awareness, or it means that all animals are conscious and that's, or, or a large majority of animals are conscious. Again, this is a philosophical question at this point, not a scientific question mm -hmm. uh, that, that reasonable people disagree on or agree on. One of the last things I want to ask you about, David, comes back to some of these new neurotechnologies. And the question that, that you brought up at the beginning of the book about the sort of stagnation that we've seen in the development of new treatments to address human psychiatric conditions. And so if, if a lot of what your research and a lot of what other neuroscientists research are showing is that behaviors and emotions and all of this stuff can be driven by specific patterns of activity and specific circuits in the brain, what does that say about the prospect of developing new and better psychiatric drugs? Because to my mind, it would seem pretty infeasible that we're going to develop drugs, pills that someone swallows, that get into the bloodstream, go into the brain, and affect only the specific circuits that we need to affect and only the specific ways we need them to be affected in order to treat psychiatric ailments. So is it possible to develop drugs that have that level of circuit specificity and you know, if it, if it, whether it is or isn't, um, are we going to be using some of these other techniques like opto or chemogenetics in human beings eventually? Yeah. So, uh, to answer your first question, I would never say never. I think it might well be possible, uh, to develop drugs, maybe not drugs that you take by mouth as a pill, but drugs that are injectable that are maybe mRNA based nanoparticles like the vaccines that we've been getting, but they're not vaccines. They cross the blood brain barrier. They get into certain specific nerve cells by means of genetic zip codes, and they reprogram the cells to do certain things. Uh, that's science fiction right now, but technology is developing so rapidly that it's, it's not impossible. Um, on the other hand, the, the use of, of, uh, chemogenetics in particular, uh, to treat brain disorders is, I think, something that is uh, potentially on the near horizon. Um, because there, uh, uh, if we can develop genetic zip codes that can be used to target therapeutic genes or, or uh, uh, genes that make a cell susceptible to a drug, uh, if we can target them to particular cell types, and we know that those cell types are involved in, uh, uh, say, fear or anxiety, and they're hyperactivated, for example, in patients with post-traumatic stress disorder or that have uh, an anxiety disorder or something like that, uh, then we could potentially endow those cells with the capability to be let's say they are fear promoting cells, we could endow them with the capability to be shut off when we take a drug, which is the chemogenetic ligand that binds to the receptor that we have programmed them to express. So we're using a drug to change the electrical activity of a cell in the brain and an entire circuit that it, it is connected to because of its effect on behavior. And, and I, I call that chemical deep brain stimulation. 
So mm. it achieves the same objective that deep brain stimulation does. And D DBS is used now uh, where you put bundles of wires in the brain and the patient has much like they would have if they had a pacemaker, they have a battery pack, they have wires and uh, deep brain stimulation is being used to treat Parkinson's disease, as well as some psychiatric disorders like obsessive compulsive disorder. And there are some data that suggests it may be use useful in depression as well. And the problem with DBS is that it's kind of hit or miss, because if you don't put the electrodes in the exact correct place in each person, then it may not work. And what chemical DBS would is, is it's doing the equivalent of DBS, that is, it's stimulating or inhibiting some neurons in your brain, but you have selected specifically which neurons to stimulate or inhibit, and you're achieving that stimulation or inhibition by taking a pill, not by having to put uh, metal electrodes into your brain. Now, it's true that until a couple of years ago, if you were contemplating that kind of an approach, you would still need to do one-time brain surgery on that patient to inject the virus that encodes the uh, the gene that will make the neurons that you want to activate or inhibit sensitive to the drug. But uh, uh, more recently, um, through work of uh, of Ben Deverman and Viviana Gradinaru um, at Caltech, uh, there have been developments in viruses that can actually cross the blood-brain barrier, which is very surprising because viruses are huge by comparison to individual proteins, and even individual proteins can't cross the blood-brain barrier, which means that if we were able to find the correct genetic zip code to address a, say, therapeutic chemogenetic uh, effector to a cell type that uh, we want to manipulate for therapeutic purposes, like a cell type that's involved in fear or anxiety, we wouldn't have to drill into the person's brain and inject the virus in their brain. We could just inject the virus into their bloodstream and the virus would circulate and it would go into the brain and it would deliver its cargo uh, into various neurons. And only the neurons that could read out its genetic zip code would uh, would express the therapeutic agent. And I think that that is no longer science fiction, uh, not just because we have uh, now the ability to have viruses that can be administered uh, in the blood and will cross the blood brain barrier, but also because of our, our ability to identify genetic zip codes for particular cell types is growing by leaps and bounds uh, because of advances in technology for sequencing the DNA and RNA of individual cells in the brain. And I'm thinking of work that's being done at the Allen Institute, a nonprofit research institute in Seattle uh, uh, that was founded by the late Paul Allen. Um, and I sit on their scientific advisory board. They are, they are making remarkable progress in being able to identify genetic zip codes that allow you to target these therapeutic genes to particular cell types in the brain. Now, there gets back to this question of, well, to do all that work, you're going to have to do it in mice. How do you know that it's ever going to translate to humans? And this is, this is where another very important uh, contribution uh, of the Allen Institute comes into play, and that is their discovery that among the myriad cell types in the brain, there are some cell types, not all, but some cell types that you can identify and recognize in a mouse, in a monkey, and in a human. They have the same shape. They express many of the same genes. They're located in the same region of the brain. They have the same electrical properties. And if you identify the right genetic zip code, that genetic zip code can be used to address a therapeutic gene to that same cell type in a mouse or a monkey or a human.
which means you can do the sort of scut work, if you will, of finding the genetic zip codes using a mouse and then sift through those and find ones that will translate to monkey and to human. And I think the that ability, if it turns out indeed that many brain disorders like Parkinson's uh, and uh, ALS are disorders of specific cell types, if those cell types are evolutionarily conserved and we can identify genetic zip codes of them by doing the work in mice and they will immediately translate into humans, then combining that with these non-invasive ways of delivering viruses into the brain that don't involve uh, uh, brain surgery, but just injection of something into the bloodstream, no different from a vaccine. Uh, I think that this goal of, of taking the knowledge from causal neuroscience that is giving us an understanding of mechanism of the circuits that promote fear, aggressiveness, anxiety, uh, and how those circuits may uh, malfunction or function maladaptively in certain emotional disorders, we may have a prayer of developing new treatments for those disorders that are more along the lines of uh, insulin for treating diabetes. They're based on an understanding of the physiology and of what happens to the physiology uh, in, in, in a disease and trying to reverse uh, that pathophysiology. Well, David, um, in the final couple moments we yeah. have here, um, do you want to talk to people about the title of your new book and what it's all about? Much of what we discussed today is obviously related to the content of that book, but there's a lot more in there. So if you yes. want to take a moment, just direct people that way. Sure. Thank you. So a lot of these uh, ideas are uh, discussed uh, in um, uh, my recent book, which is called The Nature of the Beast, How Emotions Guide Us. Uh, it's published by Basic Books. It was published uh, in uh, March of this year. And the book is really focused on answering the question, how can we study emotions in animals and what will it tell us about emotions in humans and uh, uh, about the basis of mental illness and will it help us develop new treatments for mental illness? And it focuses uh, on work done in the areas that I know about, which uh, are uh, in fear, anxiety, aggression, uh, mating behavior, and mostly work done in mice and in flies. Uh, and, and it is emphatically not a book like The Soul of an Octopus. It's not a book where it encourages you to attribute emotions to animals by anthropomorphi anthropomorphizing them. It really describes a, a, an approach to identifying emotion states and, and studying the parts of emotion states that we can get an objective grip on in an animal, in a mouse, or even in a fruit fly, and to figure out how we can use that knowledge to translate into a uh, better understanding of human brain function eventually, uh, and also mental health. So it, it, it is, uh, it's, it's really almost a story of a scientific journey and, uh, how thinking about a problem has evolved. Uh, it's not a light read, but I think if you're interested in brain science and you're interested in how scientists are thinking about these tough questions about what's emotion, what's feeling, can we study, what can we study in animals, what can we not, how do we study them, and what does that mean for developing treatments for mental illness, uh, I think you'll find uh, a lot that uh, uh, will be very thought-provoking uh, at the least. Uh, it's like like many things in neuroscience, it raises more questions than it answers, but it's at least trying to convert unknown unknowns into known unknowns. <laughs> and that will sort of put us uh, uh, on a more direct path uh, towards figuring out things like, well, what is uh, what is a insulin for the brain analogous to diabetes for the pancreas, if such a thing exists? 
Well, yes, I, I definitely recommend the book. I read it uh, in the past few days, so I'll put a link to that in the episode description. And Professor David Anderson, thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much, Nick. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.